All right, so let's catch up to where we are. There's no easy way to jump into this. I, there, I mean, I'm just going to tell you up front, I, I could not possibly, we could spend a year and I couldn't tell you everything that, that I could tell you. So I'm just trying to, I tried to stay on track so that I could just stick with Ishmael and get you to where you felt confident about every night when you turn the news on, you fully understand biblically what's going on. All right, let's recap. Remember back in Genesis 12, uh, the Abrahamic covenant where God said, I will make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You would be hard-pressed to find a more important passage of Scripture than the one I just read. So much of what is going on and basically everything we're going to talk about tonight it hangs on that passage of Scripture right there. It is by far one of the most important places in all of Scripture. All right, but Abraham and Sarah, even after that, they disbelieved God's promise of a son, and so they chose to have a son through Hagar, their Egyptian maidservant, who gave birth to Ishmael. And that's kind of where we left off last week talking about this. Then we see God's promise to Hagar concerning uh, Ishmael. Remember uh, the whole situation where Sarai uh, was uh, dealt harshly with Hagar and she left and, and traveled back to Sir. And then here we have this uh, situation where the angel of the Lord comes to uh, Hagar. Now the angel of the Lord found her by the spring and the water in the wilderness, by the spring, by the way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. And the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you're with child, and you shall bear a son, and his name shall be Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Again, that is a supremely important passage of Scripture that you could spend days just uh, studying and unearthing the treasures that are within. But for tonight, in spite of their disobedience, God remains faithful to do what He purposed to do. In other words, the fact that, that Abraham and Sarah took matters into their own hands doesn't negate what God has committed to do. So then we find in Genesis 17, God said, No, Sarah, your wife... Uh, your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly, but shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you, at this set time next year. So God makes it as clear as clear can be that His covenant is through Isaac and not Ishmael. That's what that exchange in Genesis 17 is all about. Now He blesses Ishmael and He multiplies Ishmael and He tells us all this information about Ishmael. But the critical information to know is that the covenant <coughs> excuse me, is specifically and uh, uniquely with Isaac. So through Isaac came the Jewish people, but through Ishmael came their enemies. Many of them. Now, we're focused on Ishmael, but you also have to remember that Isaac has two sons, and those two sons' names were Jacob and Esau. And Esau, and God's favor was on Jacob, and not on Esau, and the descendants of Esau are the same as the descendants of Ishmael. But we're not going to chase that rabbit, but just so that you know that all the 
Middle Eastern enemies of Israel, they didn't all, they're not all necessarily, you don't just say, well, they all came from Ishmael because a bunch of them are through Esau. But they're through all of those peoples came through, all of the Arabic peoples came through essentially those two rejected sons. So that would be a good way maybe for you to think about it. Okay? So it was out of the promises of God to the Jews that the Israel-Arab conflict was born, not the creation of the Jewish state in 1948, which so many people wrongly think. The creation of a Jewish state in 1948 was a was a uh, prophecy of God that we talked about when we studied Daniel. You can see that and Ezekiel. Um, that that's a God fulfilling a prophecy uh, because God said He was going to do that, and because it's it has to be part of the the whole plan. But just so that you understand, the problem is not because of that. Act. The problem has always been there and will always remain there because of what God said to Abraham. Because they continue to reject Jesus, Israel's history has been one of continual conflict with its Arab neighbors, just as God promised. So this wild man, Ishmael, who is going to multiply into many nations, but who is not going to be able to get along with his brothers but is going to be surrounded and dwell amongst all of his siblings. So when you look at a map of the, of the world and you look at the, uh, a map of the Middle East, what you find is all of these siblings. And now they, there's more cooperation now than probably at any point in world history in the past They've all fought with each other continually, constantly, no matter what. Even if they were two Muslim nations, they still fought and bombed each other and hated each other and because, because they're wild. And because they, God said that's what they're going to do. They're not going to get along um, and they're going to be very uh, aggressive. But Israel is still God's chosen people. So there's some, there's some wrong theology out there. Um, this idea that the New Testament church is the substitute for Israel, um, that's wrong. That's not at all what the Bible teaches. And um, I'm sure many of you in here have heard that uh, wrong teaching, but that's absolutely, positively, 100% wrong. And anybody that tells you that is completely wrong. That's not the case. Uh, we're not the replacement of Israel. Israel is God's chosen people. And so tonight you'll see all of that unfold. It's still true that the nation that blesses Israel is blessed and the nation that curses Israel is cursed. That's never changed. And I gave you one, two, three, four. There's probably 40, but I gave you four main places in Scripture for you to go and, and see that. So whenever you, um, whenever you hear me or someone else talking about uh, our frustration that uh, our foreign policy may not be what we think it ought to be with regards to Israel, or you see people who um, have signs in their yard that have a cross and says, stand with Israel or things of that nature, you understand what that's all about. I mean, what, you know, what some, some people have asked me if, if, if those are, um, if they're Jewish people that put those signs in their yard. And uh, I said, well, it could be, but, not in South Mississippi. Chances are no. Those are believers, but they don't understand. And so hopefully tonight you'll get a picture of that. So let's talk first of all about the invisible enemy, which is Satan. Satan is very involved in this situation and everything that's going on in the Middle East. So fueling these constant attacks against the Jews in Israel is Satan himself. Revelation 12 tells us that the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour the child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who would rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Talks about how Satan hates, tried to stop the birth of the child, but was unable to do that, and hates, um, is well, put it this way, Satan is forever after Christ, the child, 
and Israel, the woman who brought forth the child. In that passage in Revelation 12, Israel is the woman who gives birth to the son. And so, remember, it all goes back to Genesis chapter 12. What Satan is, uh, Satan hates everything about God and everything that God endeavors to do, but at the core of this, the tension, at the core of the problem, the reason that it never um, subsides, the, the problems for Israel, is because of Genesis 12. It's because of the Abrahamic covenant. It's because, and so you can never lose sight of the fact that Whoever blesses Israel is blessed, and whoever curses Israel is cursed. And whatever you think politically, whatever you think when you watch the news, whatever you think, all I can tell you is, is that you better understand that principle right there when you go to the polls. Because that is 100% true. It's never going to change, and it is, you'd be hard pressed to find anything more important than that. It is of the utmost importance. What about the visible enemy, which is the one we're all interested in, which is Islam? So I'm going to give you a crash course in Islam. In the 7th century, in 622, the Arab empire started to unite in power because of the rise of a man named Muhammad who claimed to be a direct descendant of Ishmael, and who we have every reason to... I mean, sure, he's a direct descendant of Ishmael. That I'm so glad that what he claims is just confirming what the Bible's already saying. So he was born in 570, so he's 40 years old when he first claims to be God's prophet. And so... Uh, what you know, there's there's a the the Quran teaches us a lot of. I mean, I I could sit here for an hour and tell you stuff about Muhammad, but I don't think it would be very useful to you. Suffice it to say that under demonic influence, and this is my humble opinion, Muhammad wrote the Quran. I mean, how else could he have done it? Which became the Muslims' holy book. Now, what 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 are? So let me just give you a couple pieces of information about the Quran. First of all, um, the Quran, what the the miraculous part of the Quran, according to Muslims, is, is that Muhammad was illiterate. And Muhammad spoke these prophecies that supposedly God gave him, and then his scribes wrote all these things down, and that's how the Quran was assembled. Muhammad, Muhammad didn't sit down himself and write anything because he was completely illiterate. He couldn't read or write. He was a um, he was a, a, a businessman who the Quran goes into great detail about how uh, what an upstanding, uh, trustworthy businessman he was, and so on and so forth. Which is just strange when you're devoted your life to studying the Bible. And so when I when I'm reading something that is supposed to be uh, supernatural and is so far from it, it's just uh, mind-boggling that, that uh, something so ridiculous can go so far, but okay. Now, why, why the, how come, how come all this uh, Islamic Radical jihadism and and uh, terrorist threats and all. What? Why now? Why didn't this blow up a hundred years ago? I mean, look, we're talking about the seventh century when all this started. The Quran. I'm reading the same Quran. The Quran hasn't changed. So, um, what? What is? What happened to change things? Well, what happened was for many, many. Uh, hundreds of years, all of the Arabic states were at war with each other, and there was no cooperation. And th there was multiple reasons for that. If you're interested in that, what you should do is you should study the Crusades, um, of the study Christian history, and look at the the Crusade period where the 
Roman Catholic Church was uh, uh, um, how can I say this politically correctly uh, where they were um, using similar tactics to ISIS against uh, Muslims and so it it drove a lot of uh, Islam underground and it 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 did make a buffer. It did give us more time before all this stuff started to brew up. But um, ISIS is not a a uh, it's not a it's not a place. It's a coalition. And now, have you noticed that our leaders are using the term ISIL? And you understand what that is? Is that they're broadening the term ISIS? So now they're saying that instead of just this organization of um, uh, Islamic states that are that are relegated around uh, a small area, ISIL is this entire region of the world. And then ISIL will translate, I'm sure, into a new name that will be even larger as it continues to grow and in influence. So what's happening is, is the cooperation amongst the Arab states is the reason why we're seeing this giant um, surge in all of this um, radical, terrorist, violent behavior. Now, all of this should make perfect sense to you because, first of all, as Bible-believing um, Christians, you know that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. And at our core... Apart from Christ, there's no heinous act that's too wicked for us to um, perpetrate. And so, if you look across world history with new eyes, and you look at at every horrific uh, genocide or horrific event across world history, what you find is that when uh, when people are in conflict with their neighbors, what happens is it, it keeps them at bay. It keeps them in check. It keeps, it keeps evil sort of in, in small pockets. Because if Iran is, you know, is busy defending its borders, then it's not worried about developing something that's going to go halfway across the globe and blow the United States up. But when they start cooperating then their eyes are off of each other and then they can focus on the, a bigger picture. And so what you're seeing is, is remember when God, uh, the angel of the Lord, went to Hagar and said he's going to be a wild man, he's going to dwell amongst his brothers, and there's going to be all this tension between them. Well, as that tension goes down, trouble goes up. And so... I'm interested right now in the, the you see these developments and they cha they're happening constantly right before our eyes. But you know now you're seeing uh, Russia, who clearly is going to play a uh, role in the end times and the ten nation confederacy, so on and so forth. And Russia, with this scenario going on with Turkey, for example, I'm very interested to see what materializes with that. You know because Again, whenever there are uh, Arabic or Islamic states that um, start aligning themselves, that's going to be a, a big indicator that things are ramping up and something uh, prophetic could be on the horizon. And I would say right now there's more cooperation right now than there's ever been before. Let me give you an example. Remember in the 80s when... Uh, Muammar Gaddafi thought he was going to, you know, act like he um, had a reason to uh, flex his muscles. And this uh, fellow from California named Ronald Reagan put the kibosh on that like you ain't never seen. Now, when that happened... Did you, do you, it's so far removed from us that we can't even imagine. But, but remember what happened. Do you remember what all of um, Gaddafi's allies did? Nothing. 
Nothing. He disappeared and they shut their mouth and nobody said a word. You know why? Because they weren't cooperating. Now what do you think would happen today? Today, every time... So what happens today? We go, for example, we go in to Kuwait because of what Saddam Hussein was doing. And what happened? All of this stuff is started up where... All, in other words, this, doesn't, this didn't have anything to do with half the countries that are all... What did this have to do with Syria? What did this have to do with Iran? What did, you see, because there's cooperation now at a level that there's never been before. And it's going to continue to increase. And that's something you should pay close attention to is that as these Islamic and Arabic states cooperate, that's going to be probably a good indicator, you know, that you could maybe, if I was looking for something, that's, that's probably what I would be looking at. Um, okay, we've got to continue where we're at. So the religion of Islam, after uh, Muhammad started it, distinguishes itself from Christianity and Judaism by choosing Friday as their holy day and Allah as their God. I just think that uh, it's hilarious that the Jews worship on Saturday, the Christians worship on Sunday. So the only thing they had left to take was Friday. So that's what he did. The goal of Islam has always been to dominate the world through compulsion. Always. And I use the word compulsion because the Koran used the word compulsion because I, my, my own vernacular would have been a much stronger word, but that's the word the Koran uses. In the Koran, there's some things you need to understand. First of all, there's no separation between church and state. That's why um, Islam and radical Islam is so politicized and they're so political and it's so completely foreign to Christians that we just, you know, can't understand anything about the way they think and operate, there, there's no separation. It's all just one. They, they operate uh, politically and spiritually at, at the same time. There's no difference. Islam divides the world into two simple categories, the house of Islam and the house of war. Every single, that, that's it. There's no gray area. There's no in the middle. So you could say the same thing about the Bible. You could say there's sheep and there's goats. Uh, but contrary to what some Islamic or Muslim uh, clerics would try to lead you to believe, that is too crystal clear. And the, the reason why they, they don't want to own up to that is because of the term house of war. But that's the term the Koran uses. Islam rejects all pluralism and claims to be the one and only true path to God. All other religions, according to Islam, are corrupt. So they're like Christianity in the sense that a Muslim believes that they are exclusive. Uh, you know, they're, they have their own version of I'm the way, truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But that's about where the similarities end. The Quran teaches that anyone who claims the doctrine of the Trinity will 100% guarantee go to hell. Um, I was reminded as I was reading, uh, reading it again, just afresh and anew, reminding myself of things that I'd forgotten, that it just struck me that uh, Muhammad, of all the, the things that he could have chosen, uh, the Trinity was just a giant burr under his saddle. And uh, it just, you know, reminds us of... It. So basically, it's a burr under Satan's saddle. Um, so there's a, there's a um, precept that you would automatically go to hell if you believe in the Trinity. They believe that Jesus was one of 124,000 prophets. And whenever you hear them on CNN, they always say that, well, no, we believe that Jesus was a prophet. And they do. But they don't tell you that they believe he was one of 124,000. They act like, well, he was a, a very special man and he's very important in, in uh, the Muslim faith. No, he's one of 124,000, which wouldn't make me feel real special. Uh, but they do believe, interestingly enough, that he was born of a virgin. They don't deny the virgin birth, though they do deny the um, crucifixion and the resurrection. But they 
they believe that he was born a vir- uh, of a Virgin Mary and that he did miracles and that he did receive uh, words from God. So they don't refute the fact that he fed 5,000 or that he, you know, uh, calmed the sea or that he healed people or whatever, but they just attribute that, that he was, he was a prophet and received uh, uh, power from Allah. Jesus to them is just another human being and anyone who ascribes deity to him. When you say Jesus is God, that is blasphemous to a Muslim who commits, that would be committing their unpardonable sin. They call it shirk. And you are doomed to hell for that. If you commit shirk, there's no reprieve from that. So I guess for us would be the equivalent of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. They believe that there are many angels and that there are many demons. Um, So they have a similar uh, supernatural belief system, although uh, they believe in Satan, but they can't decide if his name is Iblis or Shaitan. They believe that Allah is absolutely sovereign and that every single person's destiny is predetermined by Allah. You probably didn't know that um, Muslims who are orthodox and devout, which uh, we'll talk about in a second, are probably relatively rare, but we're in no camp to throw stones, uh, believe that Allah is utterly sovereign and that um, you know they, they believe totally in, uh, in the doctrine of predestination and their own warped understanding of that. They believe that there's going to be a day of judgment when, and at that point everyone will find out whether they go to heaven or hell. And it won't be before that moment. Nobody can know in advance. It's just that, that coming day that hasn't come yet, everyone finds out. Things like uh, eschatology, these sorts of questions about judgment and heaven and hell and all that, the Quran is very um, uh, vague about because they're difficult. Whenever Muhammad got to a difficult, um, a place where the Bible just, you know, blows through something and, you, you know, just you're, you, you just stand there in awe of what God's saying, the Quran falls flat on its face, and especially with things with regard to eschatology and the next life. Um, So judgment is based on a scale, the scale of life they have. Um, Interestingly enough, good things weigh heavy, and bad things weigh light. And so you don't have to do a lot of good things um, you just have to do some because your good things will, will take care of a lot of bad things. One's deeds are what's going to weigh heavy on Allah's decision, but there's no guarantees. So in other words, uh, again, one way that, that many of us uh, have been misinformed by the American press is that uh, we were, especially after 9-11, we were hearing a lot. I mean, you know, I didn't know anything about uh, Islam before that. And so I'm just believing what I'm seeing on TV. And so I'm, I'm, you know, repeating the things that I'm learning on TV that, that they, that these, uh, suicide bombers and they believe that if they commandeer a plane full of people, infidels and smash it into a building, that they're going to have this great reward in heaven and that they're going to, you know, get this planet and all these other things are going to happen and so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter is, is that though they're hopeful that that happens, there's no guarantee. The Quran does not give a guarantee to anyone. So you could potentially get a, a, a plane full of uh, infidels, smash it into the Twin Towers, and not go to heaven. That doesn't mean you're going to automatically go to heaven. Maybe you... Um, your bad deeds were such that that wasn't enough to overwhelm it or whatever the case may be, but there is no... I mean, think about... I mean, I was just thinking as I was reading, I was thinking of all the places where the Bible is so dogmatic about salvation and so crystal clear about, you know, 
those who call on the name of the Lord. And if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, and there's all of these over and over where the Scripture says, these people go to heaven. It doesn't exist in Islam. It's just you do all these things and you hope it's pleasing enough to, which would then help you understand why they do the radical things they do. Because what it does is it 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 enhances the radical nature of their followers. Because at no point would... So, for example, let's just think about Osama bin Laden. Well, when he was still alive, it wasn't necessarily and only that he was so filled with rage that no matter what atrocity he perpetrated against the United States, uh, you know, he couldn't wait to get to the next one though I'm sure he was filled with rage and hatred, but he subscribed to a belief system where he never could ever have any peace that he was pleasing enough to Allah that he would go to heaven. Therefore, that's why they continue to just never, they're unrelenting in their, uh, in their advancement of evil because there's no end. There's no, it, it never ends. So you just have to keep on being as evil as you just keep because all of those things, as you're going to see in a minute, you know, uh, what the Koran says, they're all... So basically, every time they blow something up, um, it would be like, you know, you taking in foster children or adopting a child or, you know, uh, just doing some great act of service for the kingdom of God or something like that. But for them, they, they never have peace, so they just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. All right. So no one, and I got to say, I mean no one who has read the Bible and the Koran could conclude that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. You'd have to be the most moronic. You, you, I mean, I'm just saying you just, you just couldn't, you, you couldn't do it. So every idiot that you've ever heard say this, they did not read it. I can promise you they didn't read it. They, or they, they haven't read either. Or they read one and not the other. But I can promise you they didn't read both of them. It's, it's impossible. A child who understands Sesame Street, I was, I was reading the Koran, and believe me, I want you all to know, everybody in the office has been suffering. Because I've been grumpy, grouchy, ornery. I mean, it, it, may, I mean, it, it will make you mad. But I'm reading the Koran, and it's literally the difference between the Koran and the Bible is like the thing on Sesame Street where one of these things just doesn't belong, and they got like three hammers and a popsicle. That's the, you know what I mean? Like if you were four, you'd go, oh, these are definitely different. And I started thinking about all the people that, are on, that I've heard on television say something like this. And I mean, on both sides of the fence, I mean, some evangelical fruitcakes. Say, so, well, I think we're all worshiping the same God. Okay. I guess you, you go home and drive in nails with a popsicle. That's all I know. So, so let me just help you understand. Islam teaches that everyone who worships God, the God of the Bible, is blaspheming, is a blaspheming, infidel, apostate. To quote. So if you worship the God of the Bible and not Allah, according to the Muslim religion, you are an infidel and an apostate. And when you do that, you blaspheme Allah. The Quran in multiple places condones and even commands the execution of infidels. The key word in the Quran is the word infidel. That is Muhammad's favorite term of disdain. So, and even here recently, unfortunately, after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, many U.S. news outlets repeated this phrase. I heard this the other day. True Islam is a religion of peace and love. Okay. 
All right. I'm with you. Now let's just have a little, let's have a little Koran. Let's go to Koran kindergarten real quick, okay? So there, they call their passages surah. So the surah, chapter 9, verse 29 says, I mean, I'm just quote, quoting directly from the English transla translation. Fight against Christians and Jews until they pay the tribute readily being brought low. Chapter 4, verse 91, if, if the unbelievers do not offer you peace, kill them wherever you find them. Against such you are given clear warrant. Surah 9, 5, kill the non-believers wherever you find them. Surah 2, uh, verses 191 and 2, kill disbelievers wherever you find them. If they attack you, then kill them. Such is the reward of disbelievers. Uh, chapter 9, verse 7, don't, don't make treaties with non-Muslims. They are all evildoers and should not be trusted. Surah 9.12, fight the disbelievers. Allah is on your side. He will give you victory. Surah 5, O oh, you who believe, do not take the Jew and the Christian and make them your friends. They are friends of each other, and whoever amongst you takes them for a friend, then surely he is one of them. Surely Allah does not guide the unjust people. Uh, 265, Christians and Jews must believe that Allah has uh, was revealed to Muhammad or Allah will disfigure their faces or turn them into apes as he did the Sabbath breakers. Now, you can, I mean, it's up to you, but if you, if you want, you can write underneath uh, Surah 265, you can go home and Google the words Middle East acid, A-C-I-D, in the face. Now, I'm warning you, if you click on images, you're going to get severely grossed out. But what you're going to see is picture after picture after picture after picture after picture of people. You see that right there? You see that disfigure their faces? And they take that literally and they take sulfuric acid and they throw it in people's faces because they are accused of being a Christian. I mean, but it's a, it's a, it's a religion of peace. True Islam, it, it's peaceful. Surah 448, those who ascribe uh, a partner to Allah like Christians do with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they, I'm telling you, when I say they hate the Trinity, I mean they hate the Trinity. Will not be forgiven. They have invented a tremendous sin. Surah 451, Jews and Christians believe in idols and false deities, yet they claim to be more rightly guided than Muslims. Uh, Surah 55, don't take Jews or Christians for friends. If you do, then Allah will consider you to be one of them. So there's just a little snippet of the joy that reading the Quran will be to your life. It will be such a blessing. Um, the, so here's something to consider. The primary reason, not the only reason, but the primary reason that Muslims attack the United States is not because we're Christian, but because we support Israel. They hate us because we're Christian. But you have got to always remind yourself that they hate us because we're Christian, but it is primarily because we support Israel. Because what they hate more than they hate us as Christians is they hate Israel. They hate Israel. That is their supreme hatred, is Jews. Muhammad, before Muhammad even knew anything about Christianity, he was... Uh, after, when, after he was 40 and he claimed to um, begin getting, that was the first time he publicly uh, said that he was getting revelation from God and started all this stuff. He moved to Medina, and while he was in, when he moved to Medina, there were Jewish, there were some Jewish tribes that lived in Medina, and one of the first things that him and his followers did, that's where he really started gaining uh, ground, was he, um, he excommunicated uh, one tribe of Jews out of Medina. 
Then he looted all the belongings of another one. And when he got to the third one, he just killed them all. He killed 700 Jews in one tribe for no reason, just because they were Jews. Believe me, this was way before he had anything, uh, before he hated anything that me and you believe. He hated, they hate the Jews. Now, because the United States has historically been Israel's greatest defender, Muslims today refer to Israel as the small Satan and to the U.S. as the great Satan. That is, and that is, uh, you know, common right now. That's what they're chanting and screaming and yelling. And so I can remember, um, you know, after 9-11, uh, having conversations with people and, and we would say things like, you know, we're, we're all just sort of in disbelief trying to, you know, catch up because we've been, we, we're just, we've been lulled to sleep essentially is what happened. And uh, I'm not getting into that, but, but so I remember having conversations with people and we'd say, why do they hate us so much? Like we're all scratching our head going, well, what, what did we do? You know, what, what is going on here? Like did we miss something here? Well, the reason why um, many people felt that way is because uh, it's, the, it's Israel. It's the Jews. So even at that point in time, Early on, it's hard to remember. I mean, we've been through so much now that it's hard to remember then. But, but if you back up in your mind and start thinking about that and you're seeing them like just going bananas, burning American flags and, you know, just making these big pinatas of our president, lighting them on fire and all that. And, you know, you're just going, what in the world has happened? It's Israel. It's Israel. That's the core, the root of the whole thing. The reason Israel has never fully been able to possess their land, the land that was given to them, is because they have been unfaithful to God. And this is what I think puzzles people, because people think, now wait a minute, well, why is Israel God's chosen people when they don't, even, they don't even believe Jesus was the Messiah? Like, something doesn't add up about all this. Well, that's just a... Uh, an immature understanding of Scripture. So remember, what does it always always go back to? Genesis 12, right? It's so. What, what's the what's the big um, learning point in the fact that Israel is still God's chosen people? God doesn't keep His promises based on our faithfulness. See, if you have an understanding of God that His faithfulness is based on your faithfulness, you got the wrong God. You got the way wrong God. See, when I hear people talking about this substitution, uh, this doctrine of substitution and all this kind of nonsense and about how Israel's been... They're just, they're just immature. They don't know who God is. They don't know the God of the Bible. They believe, they, they have a works-based understanding of who God is. And if you're not careful, and I'm not careful, in our, just our just daily conversations about things, we will slip into that trap in our own circumstances. You know, I'm always talking about how we, if we're not careful, we'll look around at what's going on around us and we immediately start equating bad things with, what did I do? Why is God mad at me? Man, man you know, all that. you got to read your Bible. When God promises to do something, you put it in the bank. It doesn't matter how stupid people are. So think about it. All of this is about Abraham, and Abraham blew it as bad as anybody could ever blow it. And you know what? That didn't change God. That did not change. Now, Abraham had to suffer consequences. And, also, and, and so Israel right now is suffering consequences. But it doesn't change God's promise. Don't ever, ever forget that. His promise is 
forever and eternal and He will absolutely fulfill everything He said He will regardless of what humanity does. His promise is not based on our faithfulness. That would be a catastrophic uh, theological mistake to make. So one day, Israel is going to look to Him whom they pierced. And they're going to mourn for, the, for Him as the only Son. And they will embrace Jesus as their Messiah. And they will come to salvation. That day is going to come. I'm going to go into great detail about that day next week, but that day is going to come. And when that day comes, the Messiah Himself will come and give them their land in fullness. But so don't get... Um, uh, like when Paul says, for example, we'll talk about this next week in the book of Romans. Paul says that God's going to save all of Israel. Does that make your head hurt when it says that? Well, let me help you, okay? God's going to save all of Israel, okay? The question is, when? The reason God's going to save all of Israel is because when that moment in time comes, two-thirds of Israel will have already been wiped off the face of the earth. When Hitler tried to eradicate the Jews, what percentage of the Jewish population uh, in Europe did Hitler kill? Less than one-third. During the tribulation and the great tribulation, two-thirds of Israel is going to perish. Don't, don't think that, that their unfaithfulness gets a pass. It doesn't. But a third of Israel will survive. And a third of Israel will be uh, saved. But hello, after, uh, after, the, the, after the church is raptured out, after there's going to be some monumental world events that are on the horizon that are going to, I don't care how orthodox a Jew you are, if you survive all that, you're going to be like, man, I think I need to check into that Jesus thing again. Like, uh, there's some things happening here that you see. So they're going to, the ones who survive, God's going to save them. All right. But in the meantime, until that happens, all of Israel, all of Ishmael and Esau's descendants are going to continually try to destroy Israel in order to destroy God's covenant with His people. So what is Satan's big beef? What is, what is Islam's giant beef with Israel? Why are they so... If they had the choice to eradicate Israel or the United States, which would they choose? They'd choose Israel in a heartbeat. It wouldn't even be a question. Why would they choose Israel? Because eradicating the United States wouldn't have any um, bearing on what, they, what Satan wants to do is he wants to make God a liar. Satan knows what God's promised to do, right? God didn't promise anything to Abraham Lincoln. He promised it to Abraham. Yes. And so that's, that's the whole agenda. All right. So make sure you're fully aware that Ishmael will never destroy Isaac. It'll never happen. Ever. It's impossible. So try to explain as we kind of wrap tonight up and then we'll plow in next week and I'll be able to put all these pieces together. We'll jump into the New Testament and I'll be able to put all these pieces together for you. But let's just kind of wrap up tonight by trying to explain how. How could it be in human terms? This is what I want to call into CNN every single time I hear one of them bobbleheads yapping. I want to go, could you please explain to me, yes, this is a call from Mississippi. I've got a question for you. Yeah, it's not a river, it's a state. Right. i got a question for you. I'd like you to explain to me, how is it that 5 million Jews 
are surrounded by 250 million Muslims on every side, and yet they survive. Where in any inkling of any place in world history, in any humanistic understanding that you have of anything, could you ever in a million years imagine... <coughs> Excuse me, that scenario playing out. So, <clears throat> I've got a, a, a visual for you. So I did some mathematical equations. Here's, a, here's the, the continental United States. Okay? What I did was, I equated the percentage of what percentage is the Jewish, the population of Israel compared to the uh, Islamic states around them, which is 2%. So Israel's total population is 2% of the Muslim population around them. So then what I did was I, I took 2% of the population of the continental United States which is almost the exact size of the state of Tennessee. So basically, this would be an illustration so that you can sort of get your head around what it would be like. If you could imagine that all of the states surrounding that little white dot right there were fierce enemies who lived to destroy that little white dot, and yet nobody can beat it. Nobody can beat it. They can't beat it, no matter what they try to do. And if you, um, those of you in the room that, that are uh, maybe former military or you, you're, you love watching um, those shows about weapons and advancements and all that, then you probably already know, or if not, you can go home and do some research and just astound yourself in finding out that, you know, we credit ourselves as being the... Uh, the technological leader of the world. But you know, we're not. Israel blows us away. So much of the things that we incorporate, they shared with us. They figured out things that we ain't got a clue how to do. So you remember when uh, um, uh, last year when California was in the worst drought in four bazillion years and they didn't know what they were going to do and everyone's going to die and they all had to drink bottled water and all that was going on. Remember all that? Do you know what, what, what we did? did you, you didn't see it on the news, but guess what we did? We called Israel. You know why? Because they're the only people in the world that know how to get water out of nothing. That's right. Because they know how to do it. You never heard of Israel going without water, have you? Nope. You know why? Because they know how to do it. Because they know how to do things we could dream of knowing how to do. So here's the thing. If you... It would be like me going to the preschool department and gathering up 11 little tykes from the preschool department and putting them in a uniform dressing them all up, giving them a little uniform, and then putting them on the field in the Superdome, and the New Orleans Saints couldn't beat them. It would be the same thing. It would be the same thing as a professional football team that couldn't beat four-year-olds. There's no way to even explain the reality of what is going on right in front of our very eyes. It has to be. It has to be. How could almost every page of the Quran, the Quran is not very prophetic at all, which is wise on Satan's part because it would have, you know, the, the Book of Mormon should have, took, should have taken a, 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 a lesson from the Quran because they blow it on every page. But when it is prophetic, it's moronically stupid. And yet here the Bible is just standing there in its own place and 
the very place where the Garden of Eden was, the very place where all of these uh, monumental moments in Scripture, where every single little detail that God talks about, everything that He's prophesied, all of those things. I mean, we've got we've got a war going crazy right now. Where? In modern Babylonia. It's the exact thing. I mean, you look at a map and go, it's exactly what God said would happen. Now, you know, there's still prophecies that are yet to come true. But there's not one prophecy to come true before He returns. Every single step is lined up. And so... There's no, you can't make a biblical case that something else has to happen. You can look at indicators just like I've given you some tonight and say by watching Israel, you could say that there are some things that could tell us this or things that could tell us that. But as far as definitive, everything God said He was going to do, He's done. And i got to tell you, it's a... It's an exciting time to be alive. And I hope that you're not... Um, I think the saddest thing or the most heartbreaking thing for me would be that if somebody in this fellowship were walking out of this facility with their Bible in their hand and their heart is full of fear, that would really break my heart. Because if you know what that book says, yeah, is it a mess out there? Yes. But has anything surprising happened? No. One more thing and then I'm done because there's so much I just can't stop. In the brand new issue of National Geographic that just came out, The big issue, the number one thing. You know how you're so frustrated about, you know, our leaders in the middle of everything going on and they get on TV and go, well, our biggest issue we need to look at is climate change. And you're thinking, really? And you're thinking, what's going on? So you look at the brand new National Geographic comes out, the whole issue is on climate change. Hmm. Wonder, wonder what's going on. Now, this could be uh, the the providence of God, or it just could be the the hilarious irony of life. But in case I haven't said this lately, my stepfather is one of the foremost world-renowned scientists on climate change. So he leads the charge in my pagan, unsaved family. And so while I was there for Thanksgiving, of course, they had the, you know, I picked that National Geographic up and started reading it. And I was thinking about the uh, some of the scriptures we'll talk about next week in First and Second Thessalonians about what's going to happen at the end times and all that. And I flipped it open. And because I'm interested in, in climate change, I'm interested because I see all the biblical things. And so I flipped it open and there's a giant chart in the middle of it. And it shows from 1980 to now. And it charts natural disasters. And the chart goes like this. It's astounding. It's unbelievable. It's like compounded times, compounded times. I mean, it's, it's not even, it's almost immeasurable. It's so crazy. And then they break the natural disasters up into categories. You know, they're all natural, but then there's some, so they're attributing some to this or some to that, but they're all acts of God that nobody can uh, cause to happen. 
And isn't that what the Bible says? That that would be a sign for us to know. And here it's, it's, when you look at all of history, that chart just kind of goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. And then all of a sudden you get to 1980 and it just starts going crazy. Crazy. You look at when Katrina hit, it's not even a bump on it. It's going so, so high. It's not, I mean, it's just, it's unreal. The worldwide catastrophes, the, the tsunamis, the earthquakes, the floods, the, the droughts, the, all these things. I guarantee you, it's a mess out there. But what you've got in your hand, you've got the undisputed, absolute, rock-solid promise of God. And you have nothing to fear. The only thing you should fear is wasting your time and not investing it in the kingdom of God because I'm telling you. I know a lot of preachers have been saying for a long time the clock's ticking. But they couldn't dream about the things we're seeing right now. They couldn't dream about it. The Cold War was a joke compared to what's happening right now. It's exactly what God said would happen, the way He said it would happen. That's got to encourage your heart. Our God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And He's allowing all of these things to transpire because ultimately he's going to keep his word because he always has and he always will. And all I know tonight is that I'm saved. And I know that. And I lay my head down at night and I go to sleep because I'm his. And just like he won't relent on the Abrahamic covenant, he's not going to relent on me and he's not going to relent on you. He's got you in the palm of his hand and nothing will ever take you out of the palm of his hand. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you that you are so kind to us in giving us so much in your word that we might be able to find encouragement even in the midst of what we see happening right now. And Lord, I pray that I guess this information tonight, what it can do is it can it can deepen our faith. It can solidify our hearts. It can make us really understand why you have called us to be people that sometimes it feels hard to be. It feels a little bit radical, but Lord, it's not in light of what you've said. And Lord, second of all, we can pray. We can pray that what we've talked about tonight, that God, our leaders and those whom we would elect to positions of power would understand, would understand what Genesis 12 means and would, would look back at this country and realize how the blessing of your hand has been upon us. And it really has not been as much about all of the things we've done as we like to think, but it's really been because we have stood hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder to your people, Israel. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help help those in positions of power to understand that those who curse Israel will be cursed. And, Lord, that we can never turn our backs on those whom you have put your seal and your promise upon. And, Lord, thank you Thank you that Ishmael will never prevail. He will never prevail against Isaac. And we give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you. Guys, we need to.